Good evening and welcome to this week's In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director. Glad you're able to join us for this week's conversation. Once again, if you look around the surroundings, I am not in the studio. We'll be back there at some point. And no, just so you know, this is not one of those broadcast tricks where when we go back into the studio, the In Focus set will look dramatically different. They are not building us a new studio. It's going to look like it's always looked. We just wanted to get out in the community a little bit. Also want to provide you with some information as to what's going on around the community. So remember, if you're a not-for-profit organization, has some information that you want us to pass along on the community calendar, please send us at least two weeks ahead of time. Send us a flyer to wctv at iue.edu. We'll be more than happy to put that information on the air. And remember, it doesn't cost not-for-profits anything. Hayes Arboretum is having Nature Play Days Friday, tomorrow, from 2 to 4. Take the kids for an afternoon at Hayes Arboretum. A great time for all, free, open to the public. If you need more information, check out the website, hayesarboretum.org. June 15th, 8.30 p.m., The Lion King at Westside Park in Lions Park. It is free. Bring a chair and some blankets. Saturday the 16th from 12.30 to 2. Um, check out what's happening at Cope Environmental Center. Silly Snakes. Doesn't sound like anything I want to be around. 855-3188 for information. That gives you a little look at what's going on around the community. If we have time at the end of these conversations, we'll provide you with more information. But in the meantime, let's turn to our first guest, Josh Russell, who is the new. You've been here less than 90 days, right? Less than 90 days, yes. Still get to call you new. <laughs> Executive Director of the CCDC, um, which is at the Innovation Center at all right, we'll get into all of that in a minute. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Um, let's start with you, a little bit about you. You're from here, but I there am. may not be a lot of people who know your background, so give us some details. Uh, yeah, so graduate of Ball State, well, graduate of Richmond High School uh, in 93, graduate of Ball State in 98, uh, degree in geology. Uh, my kids like to say that I have, I'm a rock star. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, good times. <laughs> so I uh, went out to Colorado, as every environmental geologist wants to do when they're out of college, and uh, worked in the environmental field for a couple years in Colorado, came back uh, to Indiana, worked in an environmental field for a few more years, um, and then got into construction, uh, specifically business development, large construction projects, worked for a couple of different companies in Indianapolis, focusing on large-scale construction projects around the Midwest, and then uh, in 2014, chose to move back to Richmond um, and uh, was in pursuit of some, some uh, opportunities here that uh, uh, through various reasons or not just didn't work out. So, but I remained here. My wife is here. My father's here. My mother's here. My, all my in-laws are here. So it just kind of made sense to stay here. So, Okay. Um, Let's go back to large-scale construction for a minute, because yeah. that, that was interesting. When you say large-scale scale construction, what in particular were you doing and what size scale are you talking about? So I worked for a couple different companies, uh, one of which was a, a, a Midwest contractor. Actually, really, I think they're a national contractor now. Um, focused on projects everywhere from Indiana Convention Center to... Uh, they imploded the, uh, the Hoosier Dome. Mm -hmm. um, I worked for the engineering firm that did the engineering work for Lucas Oil Stadium, for Banker's Life, for Pepsi Coliseum. I did a tremendous amount of healthcare construction work, which is really kind of a different beast in and of itself. I mean, you're, you're required to keep the, the environment in operation while you construct or renovate in, okay. in many cases. So. Um, I developed a little bit of a niche there um, in terms of healthcare construction just because you, you kind of have to know the lingo a little bit. You have to know what it goes into to operating a hospital um, so that you can speak to it wisely as you're developing a scope of work and schedule around that. So mm -hmm. that's just kind of a, a smattering of some of the experience I have. What interested you in the, EC, the CCDC? CCDC? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I think that... I get one per interview. <laughs> All right, you're done. I'm done. <laughs> I think that, to be totally frank, I think what I saw... I did a lot of research before I took the position, first of all. Sure. I spoke to uh, past um, executive directors or innovation center directors. Uh, I talked to past chamber presidents. I spoke to the chamber president. 
um, not in great detail, but just wanted to do as much research on what they were looking for as the position kind of came to be, because it's a different model than the organization has seen in the past. Right. So in doing that research, what I found was they were in dire need of change, and I'm a change driver. Um, I, um, I, well, one, in my construction background or in my construction experience, I very commonly would work with economic development coordinators at the county level or city level across the state because they're looking to impact whether it's their retail business or manufacturers are looking to impact their jobs, mm -hmm. which in turn is an increase in square footage, which you start with construction. So um, I knew what they were looking for before I went in to the conversation and interview. Okay. Um, after I had done the research and I started speaking with them, I realized pretty quickly that this was not only was it something that I'd be interested in, in terms of driving change. If you looked at some of the skills that I've picked up in my career, probably suits it pretty well. Um, I think you could probably, you would probably find through a lot of people that I've worked with that. I run kind of fast in terms of my work speed. I'm pretty high energy. I, I knew that the, the organization needed change, and I was ready for that change. All right. Let, let's talk about CCDC, and as we throw that out there, Center City Development Corporation. Yeah. What is, let's start there, what is that? So Center City Development Corporation is just that. It's a development corporation. Our focus is economic development, and that is in the form of community engagement through true economic development, so looking at economic drivers to impact an area, mm -hmm. um, and then our kind of third bucket, I would call innovation. Um, innovation Center, as an example, sits in that third bucket of focus. Um, economic development, I'm looking at everything from empty buildings, mm -hmm. um, ordinances, zoning ordinances, okay. um, helping kind of turn around our our downtown, specifically our downtown environment, mm -hmm. to help revitalize it from a retail standpoint. Okay. Um, and then the last piece, community engagement, it's, it's engaging the community in, in activities that um, really help sponsor all the other activities we're trying to accomplish. So, you know, from the meltdown to, you know, perhaps at some point in time we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do from a, a downtown event, um, you know, the parade, the Rose, the, the Rose, the Rose City Parade, I think is what it was. Used to be the Rose Festival. Rose Festival, thank you. Right. Um, you know, those types of events I could see falling under the, let's say, the jurisdiction of Center City, but we'll need a lot of volunteers and money and all those kinds of things. So. Okay. Let's, let's dive into those just a little bit more. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm not going to go because you're under 90 days, so we're only going to go so far <laughs> with this. But there is conversation, has been conversation. One of the things that, that people are talking about is what's the difference between Center City Development Corporation and the Innovation Center? Because if you talk to some people, those two things have always kind of seemed to be the same. Yep. But you're saying they're not. No, the, that's my mission right now, to, to educate folks on exactly what, what the organization looks like in terms of if you were plotted out on an organizational chart, what mm -hmm. does it look like? Right. So Center City Development Corporation is a development corporation with the mission that we just kind of spoke about. Mm -hmm. um, the Innovation Center is an asset of the development corporation. Long term, I see us having many different assets over a period of time. I could see us as a corporation being a conduit financially for both public and private entities to funnel money through us to buy buildings that that become vacant to help control the use of those long term. Okay. So the conversation that's going on right now surrounding what might or might not happen with the Elder Beerman yeah. building as an example. Absolutely. That's a great example. Yeah. So the Innovation Center just happens to be one of those assets that we'll likely own long term. Um, my number one goal as a director at the Center City Development Corporation is to, I look at that as an asset. And just like a business, mm -hmm. um, my goal is to increase the value of our assets. <laughs> so um, my hope is that we take that value, increase it at, at uh, you know, as, as quickly and as 
is, is increase the value as much as we can possible. And that's through partnerships, programming, um, partnerships, if you will, with our five institutions that exist here today, arguably six, um, you know. Educational institutions. Educational institutions, yeah. Okay. Um, so those would be the partnerships. The programs would be anything that those institutions would want to to, to work with here at the Innovation Center. Okay. Um, but also we'll look at some programming on our own. And, and Kate Barber, who is the director at the Innovation Center, is her her nine to five job, eight to five, well, seven to seven job <laughs> is that, is to take- it Keeps expanding. It does, it does. I mean, it, 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 it's, I know how hard she works and she's done a, a pretty good job um, with respect to, to looking at where those partnerships lie and where to take it to the next level. Outside of wishing that you could lay the asphalt down yourself and fill some of the holes in the street along here, yeah. uh, beyond the construction that's happening in this area right now, what are the top couple of priorities for you as you really kind of get a feel, get through the meetings, and really start planting your vision on what this area should look like? That's a good question. Um, it's probably more than, I'll cut it to three, but it's probably way more than three. Sure. Um, I think the first thing was to kind of be that megaphone. I think I was quoted in the paper as being a megaphone for the downtown businesses. Okay. That's a big part of it. In, in being specific in what I do there, um, I think that there are zoning ordinances that if we don't have, we should have. Okay. And if we do have, should be enforced. Um, that's working with the city um, and helping them enforce those. So clearly identifying them and figuring out where they apply. Now, I think in the past, whether they exist or don't exist, ordinances it is, mm -hmm. we've also had to look at what's the cost of enforcing those, not just from a, hey, somebody knocking on the door and saying, hey, your, your, your building here is, is violating an ordinance um, versus what kind of legal bills does it, or what, what type of legal professional sure legal services do we need to, to pursue these ordinances? So I think we need to mirror that up a little bit, you know, understand what the cost is to do that. Um, I do think that one of the things I'd like to see done, and, and I know that I've talked about it with a number of different people, but in, in putting in a what I'd call an, an overlay zone, which is essentially taking our central business district and looking at the uses, the permitted uses of the structures there, mm -hmm. and potentially pulling out some of the permitted uses. Um, what that does is it, it, it doesn't mean we won't allow those to happen, th those uses to be to take place in, in the downtown quarter, the central business district, but it, it gives a little more control to, say, perhaps someone like myself who's running a development corporation and being a representative of the downtown businesses. Um, you know, that downtown, we have a TIF district down here, which Correct. is, um, which, uh, doesn't bode well if we have a bunch of nonprofit uh, institutions downtown who aren't paying taxes, which then don't affect our TIF. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a couple of nonprofits that exist down here today. I think they do a pretty good job of understanding that they are nonprofit and they offer value in another way. Okay. Um, I think that should be recognized. But and we had the mayor on a few weeks ago, and he talked about that. Yeah. He, he talked specifically about Lifted Church, who yeah. is is taking over the Veaches building. Uh, and talk very positively about what he thought their impact might be. I think their impact is that which I've seen so far, and I don't see it changing at all. I think they will have a nothing but a positive impact downtown. Now, what I don't want to see, and I think the mayor would agree with me, is on the next block down or the next block west, another nonprofit, perhaps even another church. I don't think we need that. I think we need to put control measures in place. Okay. Um, I've asked uh, the, the, the Lifted Church folks, and specifically Matt Smith, I've asked him directly. We've had a great conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, he is ready to put his volunteering workforce to work, um, and there are a lot of places that we need him downtown, and he's offered that. And I think that's the value that he brings there versus mm -hmm. taxes right now. Yep. I'll take the volunteerism over taxes any day of the week, okay. considering what they're paying in taxes or what they would be paying. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, if you'd asked me without knowing Matt and, and not knowing their mission, mm -hmm. I'd say I have a big question mark as to the value they bring to the downtown community. After knowing him, knowing their mission, knowing their, what, what they're doing, um, I'm anxious. I'm anxious to see the positive uh, influence they'll have downtown. Great.
There's obviously some other things that are happening. The mayor has talked about the loop, still trying to finish up some stellar projects. How much control are you taking on as far as some of that, like getting the stellar facades um, piece completed? That's something that's been talked about for a while. Is that something that falls to you? Is that still ha being handled out of the city? And, and how much conversation are you having about how that's moving? I definitely have experience in the stellar program. I pursued a couple of projects when I was in construction. Uh, that were funded by Stellar, um, or Stellar designation has three different buckets of grants that it pulls from. It was uh, a project that I pursued was, was funded by OCRA, um, the Office of Community and Rural Affairs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any involvement, and the reason for that, I think, honestly, is because a lot of the work had been done prior to me being involved. And I, from what I gather right now, I think, uh, Jack Cruz and the, the infrastructure development uh, uh, director mm -hmm. is doing a fine job. I mean, I've, I've had good conversations with him. I've had great conversations with the mayor. I think that they're doing all that they can right now. Um, I know that the stellar grants, this, the stellar designation and the grants that come with it take some significant management to ensure that they're used properly and effectively, maybe is a better way to put it, not properly, but effectively. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing these facade projects get underway. I think last I talked with Jack, I think they were, they were hashing through some details, but they're not far from, from awarding the contract, so. We're down to our last couple of minutes. Yeah. What have you heard so far in, in your first couple of months on this job that really excites you and have you looking forward and you're excited for the community to find out, understand, and also grasp? Well, I'm really excited that, so whenever I see a, a challenge like I see downtown, I see opportunity. So just like you mentioned before, there's a lot of, I think, community confusion behind mm -hmm. Center City and the Innovation Center. Correct. So that's a challenge and I see that as an opportunity, meaning that it gives me the opportunity to get out and meet with as many folks in the community as I can to describe what I see. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I'm speaking directly from the bylaws, so it's kind of funny to me that as an organization that you know, I, I look at the bylaws as my operating uh, contract essentially, and, and so that excites me. Um, I'm nothing, I want nothing but positivity out of this office um, and these people and that's all we've done so far right. uh, the thing that excites me right now is that I have just maybe by some of the actions that I've made over the last 60 days 45 days whatever we're at I, it's excited people in a way that they see change and that's why I took the job right I, I was excited about change I know that I can drive it um, I have to commend the board of directors that that um, focus on managing this organization because they've really looked at me and said, you know, go, do what you got to do, right? Ask permission where you need to, but, you know, do what you got to do. And, and they've really empowered me to, to drive some of that change. So those are two pretty exciting areas. I think the third thing that I see, you know, everybody sees the empty buildings downtown, you know? Sure. And like I said, you know, where I see, where lots of people see challenge and, negativity I look and I see great opportunity and positivity and so that's what's that's what gets me excited and that's what helps me get up on a Monday morning okay <laughs> I'm sure people are looking forward to to seeing what you do what your team does um, over the next few months over the next couple of years to, to, to help build this this downtown area into um, what this community would like to see it be thank you so yeah. thanks for taking some time I'm sure we'll talk to you again in the thank future you. Josh Russell, Executive Director, Center City Development Corporation. We'll take a break, continue with In Focus with our guest, Kelly Cruz Nicholson. And welcome back to In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director of Whitewater Community Television. Thank you for joining us for this edition of In Focus as we have moved uh, this week's show to the Innovation Center 
814 East Main Street in uptown, downtown, center city, wherever it is that you want to call it, Richmond, um, a great place to hang out. And my guest for this segment, the long segment of this week's In Focus, is Kelly Cruz Nicholson, community liaison, community partners for child safety, Children's Bureau Incorporated. That is it in a nutshell. Which is a not-for-profit organization. We are. That I had not really heard about until mm -hmm. I started doing some some research. Mm -hmm. So why don't you start by telling us what the Children's Bureau is? We actually do adoptions. We do foster care. We do uh, the CCDF uh, voucher for child care. We do um, home-based case management. We do home-based therapy. They, we have residential treatment centers. Um, and all of these things are encompassed. Children's Bureau actually is a non-profit agency. Um, it was brought together by the Glick family, which is also, um, they also do uh, carriage house apartments, is, is the Glick family. So I started working at Children's Bureau 11 years ago, and um, it, was, it was more one of those things where I had gotten out of working directly with children and family, and um, I was working uh, directly with addicts at the time. And I, I just wanted to kind of get back to what I was more comfortable with, what I liked. Mm -hmm. um, and so I applied at Children's Bureau, and then my office is actually in Connersville. Right. But um, the actual main office, our home office, is in Indianapolis. And um, I, I got a job there as what is considered to be called a community liaison. As a community liaison, Oh my gosh, I can't even explain to you what my job consists of. I mean, Give honestly, you know, time. we tell, well, I tell people, you know, all the time, I'm just like, they say, well, well, what do you do? And I say, what do you need? Because that's where we start. Uh, we are a strength-based organization. Um, we are not prevention, or we are not intervention. I'm sorry, we are prevention. And so what we try to do is go into the homes and work with families to keep them out of the system, if they've been in the system, to keep them from going back into the system, um, just to kind of help families get on track and uh, be better for themselves and for the community and for their families. So I have done everything from, um, we frame it a little differently, uh, you know, I've done everything from household organization um, to, you know, writing resumes, to teaching classes, to um, working on IEPs with, with uh, the school officials. Um, you name it, whatever the family needs, then that's what we work on. And what we do is we go, a lot of people, you'll go in to someone's home as a, as a home-based case manager and they will sit down and you'll think to yourself, oh my goodness, I can see 50 things that this family needs, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and our job is to ask the family what they think they need. And at that point, they may something say something as simple as, I, I'd like for our family to sit down and have dinner together one night a week. You know, um, sometimes their, their requests are just that simple. Um, and so we work on, you know, how are we going to make that happen? What would be the best thing for us to do in order to get your family all around the dinner table at one time? Uh, I know that it, it's difficult for families. Um, it's difficult for my family. I mean, my gosh, you know, we all get Running off work different at different directions. times. Everybody's going different places. Um, it's so much easier to go to McDonald's, something like that, pick up some fast food, take it home, and then we start working on nutritional value. You know, what's, what's good for, for your body, you know, uh, what's good for your children, what's good for growth, things like that. Um, and so when I have worked with families, my gosh, um, because we're not-for-profit, we, we work off of a grant, which is the 401B, and what we do is we have some funds that will help with utilities if a family is having um, trouble getting their utilities on track or their rent on track or something like that. But, you know, we don't have a lot. And so um, we work on limited funds to help these families get where they need to be. And sometimes it's just as simple as, you know what, I was sick, my child was sick, I wasn't able to work for two weeks, I have a light bill coming up. You know, can you help me with this light bill? Um, sometimes it's more in-depth. Uh, I teach classes now. Uh, I have a coworker. Her name's Emily Creech, and we have started doing classes at the Excel School, and uh, I love it because I, I love giving that information to folks. And um, we teach, you know, job search. Uh, we teach parenting classes. We teach budgeting. We teach money management. We do nutrition. You know, 
all, all of the above, anything that they would be interested in us teaching a class on, then we, we provide that service um, to those folks. So um, with our agency, I think the good thing is, is, is you, there are no financial requirements to be involved in our agency. The only requirement is you have to have a child in your home under the age of 18 years old. Uh, you know, we have a lot, yeah, we have a lot of grandparents that are raising their grandchildren. Sure. Um, we have single moms, single dads. You know, as long as you have a child in your home under the age of 18, then you are available for services. And we sat down and more than anything, it's a connection, uh, working with a family, connecting with a family, knowing what their needs are, making them feel comfortable. You know, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of people have a negative, um, negative thoughts around um, Department of Family and Children's Services. Sure. Um, you know, and they're, uh, you know, they're called DCS. Well, our our company is Community Partners for Child Safety, which is CPCS. So a lot of times when we show up, people automatically say, "Oh my gosh, you know, this is DCS. They're going to take the my office. child away." It's exactly, good. and so. You know, to kind of sit down and say, this is not what we're here for, you know, let, let's let talk about, which, you know, the bad thing, too, is is DCS, they get a bad rap. You know, they are there to help families. Um, they're not just there to take children out of their homes, you know, and I think that, um, you know, they kind of get a bad rap for that sometimes. But because we work closely with DCS and probation and the schools, and we all want to just make a better environment for the children and the family. And sometimes it's just difficult to get that done. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. Our guest is Kelly Cruz Nicholson, Community Liaison, Community Partners for Child Safety. I'm gonna read the whole thing. Children's Bureau Inc. And we're talking about Children's Bureau Inc. and what you do. Yes. I noticed that there are various districts. You mentioned that your office is in, in Connersville, which yes. I believe is District 12. Yes. You cover multiple counties. What counties out of that office um, are you working in? I actually only work in Wayne County, okay. which um, is, you know, you wouldn't think that there would be enough of a caseload, you know, but there's actually two of us in Wayne County. So, um, you know, I, like right now, I have a caseload that has 26 families on it. So, you know, um, some people require a lot more um, attention than others. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, want to see me twice a week. Some people are like, you know what, I'm good if I see you like twice a month, you know, how, whatever works for the family. And that, that's what I think is important is because um, people don't understand that, you know, I, I get so frustrated when I hear people say, well, they're on welfare because they want to be on welfare or, you know, they just don't have a job because they don't want to work. That, that is not the case, you know, um, there are so many there people out there. Cases. There are those cases. Don't get me wrong, but those cases are actually fewer and far between than you may think. You know, honestly, um, the families that I work with and, and the families that I service are are very engaged in services. You know, they they want things to be better for their family. And sometimes, you know, we get in a hole where we just don't know how to make things better. And I think that. Um, you know, and sometimes, and then that's where we come in and talk to the families and say, okay, you know what, let us help you to, to just get that step up. And um, I think that's important because, you know, uh, people who, and like you said, there are those families that just, you know, well, just pay my bill for me and then, you know, then I'm done. Or I just need, you know, beds for my kids and then I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, but there are people who are really out there struggling that, that want to work. And, and can't find work or babysitter, you know, childcare is a factor. There are people who work or working there multiple are people jobs that are, and, and exactly. yeah, you mentioned childcare is an yes. expensive proposition. Oh my gosh, family. yes, yes. I, I mean, myself, I know, and I, you know, I had to pay childcare for a while for, you know, for my grandson and I, I was flabbergasted at how much it cost for him to, to go to preschool, you know, and I was just like, how do these parents do it? You know, and, and if you're a single parent, I mean, I, you know, my husband and I both contributed and, and it was, and, and you know, other grandparents, you know, it, how, how do they do this? How do they manage? Mm -hmm. And um, I talked to a lot of moms, I talked to, I talked to mostly moms, but I talked to a lot of dads who are just like, you know, tell me where I need to go. Tell me what I need to do. 
And unfortunately with the CCDF voucher, which is the child care voucher, you know, there are limited funds for that too. So, uh, you know, a lot of times there's a huge waiting list, you know, to get on to be able to, to even receive the child care voucher. And um, in that time, you know, if you have two children that you need to pay daycare for while you're at work, you know, as expensive as child care is, by the time you pay $50 a day per child, you know, to go to daycare, there's your paycheck. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, okay, well, how am I going to pay my bills now? You know, I still need to get groceries and how am I going to do that? And I think that a lot of people don't understand that when you receive um, public assistance, things like that, you know, there's, there's a cutoff level, level. You can only make so much money in order to receive, you know, services. And so for those folks that are working parents mm -hmm. and still not making it, they're making just enough money that they can't receive, you know, services. So, you know, so we are a free and voluntary service and we help families by connecting them with uh, food banks. Um, we connect them with clothing banks. Uh, we have done beds for families before. Um, just going into their homes and just saying, you know what, it's overwhelming to look at your entire house and say, oh my gosh, what do I need to do? So let me help you. Let's start with this corner right here. You know, what would you like to do here? How would that make your life a little bit easier? And, you know, it's funny because when people hear that and they go, really? You know, but I know as I get overwhelmed just in my house, you know, I'm tired. I've, I've been working all day. I come home. I don't want to make dinner. I don't want to have to take the dogs outside or clean the house, you know, this, that, and that, because I've, I've had all this other stuff going on all day. And that's what people don't understand. These parents do have things that they're dealing with, mm -hmm. you know, and they do need just that little push to get over the hump. So. As you look at things, and you, and you see things from two different ways. Because I do. Because you see things from your work life, but yes. you also see things from a government standpoint. I do. Is it that there are not enough resources flowing or that resources are still kind of so siloed that people get lost. It, it's almost overwhelming trying to figure out where something is that you need. And I think, actually, I do think that's part of it. And, and one thing that we do um, is we have what's called our community resource guide. Well, you know, it's, it's easy to go to a food pantry and they go, Here's this piece of paper. This will tell you where all the food pantries are at. Have at it, you know. But unless you know how to utilize this resource guide or know how to have transportation to get to places that you need to get to, mm -hmm. have the time, you know, to, to go to some of these places, because some places you go to, it can take you two hours to do the application and get through the whole process to be able to do the things that you need to do. And, and it does, it becomes very overwhelming for parents, especially folks that have to take their children with them. Uh, it can be very difficult, yeah. So I think it's more, um, I, I think the resources are there. I think that they're learning to utilize the resources that are in front of you is very important. Um, you know, people have, it, people are proud, you know, they don't want to ask for help, mm -hmm. you know, um, they don't want to say, you know, I have food for my kid, you know, or we really need help, you know, with these utilities. Believe it or not, people are, are proud. They, they don't want to have to say, I need help. They want to be able to provide. They want to be families. able to do it. Yeah. And it's very frustrating. Um, and, and a lot of people get very depressed because you know what, they're just like, I'm 36 years old and I, I can't take care of my family. What, you know, what am I doing wrong with my life? You know, and I think that um, that's where we kind of step in and go, you know what, if you're not doing anything wrong. Let's just show you how to kind of do things differently. And I think that that's helping people to understand there's a different way to do things is really important. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We are out of the studio again this week at the Innovation Center in, in Center City and talking to Kelly Cruz Nicholson. I noticed on, on the website for your organization, and, and it really caught my eyes, we're coming up to Father's Day mm -hmm. this weekend. Um, there's a push for putting dad back in the family. Yeah. Um, 
that is an across the board idea i think that that males in a lot of positions either haven't stepped up or need to step up more how is your organization kind of tackling that thought process well we actually have a whole different program it's called father engaging um, and we have a group of individuals there mainly males that that work in the father engaging program um, who go out and specifically work with those fathers you know um, and it, to help get the family together fathers who aren't in the home but still want to be involved things like that so you know there is a push to keep that family connection there with those children and and um, father engaging I I love that program because they also can go into um, the jail system and talk to those fathers who have been incarcerated and who are going to be coming out you know and how am I going to reconnect with my kid? How am I going to be able to support? And so they're able to work with those folks. And, and I, think it's, I think it's a really good thing because um, there are those folks that, out there, those guys out there that don't want to have anything to do with their children. But nine times out of ten, there's a rift between mom and dad. So that's why dad's not involved. Um, and, you know, working on one of the things that we offer is co-parenting. You know, you don't have to like each other, but you need to get along together for your kids. You know, and I think it's important because your your children are going to, they're going to copy you. They're going to uh, imitate what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and how you treat each other is going to have a big effect on how your children go out into the community and treat other people. So, yeah, I give big kudos to our Father Engaging program because they're getting out there and they're talking to folks. They're helping them reconnect. They're helping them stay connected and helping them kind of move forward with their families. Mm -hmm. Does government, in your mind, need to do, and, and we'll, we'll talk state government, okay. need to do more or less when it comes to family and social issues? Oh, that's tough. Um, personally, um, I, I feel like that they need to do a little more. Uh, this is just me and my personal opinion. Um, some people would disagree with me, sure. but I don't think that... But you've um, got a perspective that a, that a lot of people I don't do. have. You I go do. into people's homes. I do. A I lot do. of people have conversation around the edges That's right. about things. But they're they not have in a the belief trenches. system. But right, they're, they're not meeting yeah. these people where they are That's and right. you are. That's right. And I think that, um, you know, when it, it's so frustrating to me when, um, you know, government cuts funds uh, for, you know, um, food stamps and uh, Medicaid and, you know, all of these services that it's only hurting the families that I work with. You know, there's, uh, I don't know if you've heard about um, the talk that, um, you know, the you have to be drug tested now in order to receive your food stamps yes. and things like that, you know, and a lot of people are like, yes, you know, you should be drug tested. You know, it's not about the parent. It is about the child. And I think that that's where people get lost is these parents receive food stamps. I understand that, but they have to be able to food, feed their children, you know, and they're just, oh, they're just going to use those food stamps on drugs, you know. There is that small portion of people, okay? Mm -hmm. But it mainly, they're feeding their children, you know? Um, I think that um, I have a lot of issues with, with that, personal issues with that, because I do see it, and I see it every day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and because, you know, I also do drug and alcohol counseling, or I did drug and alcohol counseling for a while, right. I, I know what these people are thinking. And I know how hard it is, you know, people just, well, they just need to stop. They just need to, to stop taking drugs, which is a big thing right now in our community. It is not that easy to just stop. It's like saying they just need to stop smoking cigarettes. There you and go. And some people. Some people can, but. Can't. That's right. It is, it is a say. hard thing. That's right. Because you know what? When those drugs exist, your problems don't. When you take those drugs away, those problems are still there, and you have to face them. And at some point, you know, you've got these these people that are that's their coping mechanism. You know, that's how, that's how they get through that day because they can't face the other stuff that's gone 
that's going on. And I think that, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating drug use, but, you know, somebody would probably say, Kelly Cruz Nicholson was advocating <laughs> drug use. No, I'm not. What I'm saying is that it, it's not as easy as people think. And, and you know, and it, and it is, it is difficult, but it, at the end of the day, it is still about the children. And that's where, that's where it gets me. Because when you're cutting these services, and I have to tell people, you know what, you know, I'm, I'm very sorry, but they cut services for program A. And so therefore, that limits my ability to help you with this. You know, it, I hate that. I hate it because I, you know, I want to be able to say, yes, I can help you do everything. But then I am limited. And um, it, makes it, it makes it difficult. And I think that as... Um, Political leaders need to take a step back and say, what if this was my child? What if this was my family? What if it was somebody who was in my family? And address it maybe from that point of view. So, yeah, I have a little, I, it, that's a little stingy subject for me. So, yeah. Let's bring yeah. it closer to home. It um, does, yeah. For Richmond, Wayne County. Uh huh an area that was hard hit uh -huh. by a lot of manufacturers yes. closing. Uh -huh. um, wage scales uh -huh. have changed through the years. This was an area that was big on manufacturing. Manufacturing for a long time was very stable. Right. Manufacturing for a long time had very high wages. Right. Um, when those moved out, different wage scales came back in. Right. The number of working poor in this community went up. Mm -hmm. um, places that never thought um, communities and schools would be necessary in their area, yeah. it's necessary in their area. There is a lot of hurt, there's a lot of pain, things are getting better. We're talking about forward Wayne County and how to move mm -hmm. the needle and things, right. but this area is still having some pain. A right. number of families in this community are still having pain. Yeah. How do we get those organizations that are all trying to do well, some of them churches, some of them um, community-based organizations. Mm -hmm. How do we get them working together more, or are they, more than we think, working together more to support the families in this immediate area? Because those are the people who you are immediately working with. Well, and I think um, probably the biggest um, I guess what I would say is, you know what, um, bring someone to your meeting who is actually in the trenches. And I'm not talking about someone like myself. I'm talking about, you know what, go out in the community, talk to these people, bring someone to your meeting and say, you know, you live in this. It, what is, you talk to us. Instead of sitting on the outside, which these are, are great, great things are happening. You know, th mm -hmm. I, I understand that and I applaud everyone who is pushing our community. I truly do. But you know what? Sit down and talk to those people that are inside that bubble because it, it they feel left out. Um, it's one thing, I, and I've, I've said to this to so many people, I've, I've offered so many times, you know what? Ask me. Go with me to visit my families. Um, talk to them. You know, uh, they will tell you. They love to talk. They love to tell you things once they're comfortable with you, you know, and they'll tell you exactly the struggles that they're having, you know, because it, you don't truly understand until you're there. We no longer have a middle class. There, there is no longer a middle class. It is, as you said, the working poor. Nine, I would say probably 65%, if not higher, of our population is living paycheck to paycheck because that's that's just the way it is and they're managing the best way they know how so you know what it's good to talk about these things and put these things in place but go and talk to the people who are going to tell you how it really is because some things you know we put in place it's, it's not going to work for everybody you know it, it's just not going to and you know i tell my clients all the time you know i'm just i i say to them i'm very honest i say you know what sometimes i don't know any better than you so you need to talk to me so I can help you find something that can help you out. Because sometimes I don't know. 
And I am one of those people who sets in on committees and things like that and says, you know, yes, this is what we need in our community. But you know what? Sometimes I don't know how to help our families. And sometimes there's things that we put in place that my families are just like, <laughs> thanks for the Band-Aid. You know, and I think that that's why we get out there, talk to the people that are in the community that are actually in inside that bubble that they see themselves as not being, as not receiving any help. Nobody cares about what they're going through. And I think that that's, that's one of our big things. Economic development has been the conversation. It's been about bringing jobs in. It's been about trying to help people skill up mm -hmm. to take the jobs that are here as a, mm -hmm. as a member of Common Council. You're there, you support those initiatives. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can better answer the question of how do we connect your families mm -hmm. better to those things that are there? Are, are we not are we not getting the word to them correctly? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, y you say something, you say something, you say something, and, and I've done it and you've done it. There, the number of people that are invited to meetings, yes. you walk in and it generally tends to be the same people mm -hmm. moving in and out of those meetings. Yeah. How do we connect the families that are most in need of the services to the services that are there? How do we make that? How do we make that connection with them? Where do we need to speak that we're not speaking? Right. Well, I'm going to take it back to what you talked about the jobs because this is one of the things that um, my coworker and I do. One of the things that that you have to look look at is most applications now you have to fill out online. Okay. If you don't have access to a computer, and you can go to the library, but Let's just say you don't know how to navigate these search engines that will get you to the application that you need to fill out. You know, that's one of the things that my coworker and I teach at the Excel school. These are search engines. This is how you navigate these search engines. These are places that you can go to where you can use a computer. There's Wi-Fi, you know, this, that, and the other. And people are just like, oh, come on. Who doesn't know how to, to navigate? A lot of people have no idea how to navigate to even fill out an application because everything is online now. Um, you know, it, appropriate dress. Do you know, um, it sounds kind of crazy to say, but that's one of the things that we talk about. People not knowing or understanding dressing for the job that they want. Um, going to an interview and knowing that, you know, you're not going to wear holy jeans and tennis shoes you know, for a job that you're, you know, a retail job. I mean, just mm -hmm. there are certain things that it's not, and it's not saying that people are stupid. It's just saying that they're, they're operating off the resources that they have. So let's, let's meet people where they are. And when it comes to these jobs, Sugar Creek, I was super excited because they actually had a job fair at the Dwyer building. But what they do is they have a van that will pick people up, take them to work, and bring them back to the same spot every day so transportation is not a problem. They will help out with child care so that child care is not a problem. They have uh, bilingual um, supervisors. Language barrier is not a problem. These are things that I think are very, very important. Um, and when you say to someone, when it gets out, you know, there's going to be a job fair, you know, it, it goes out on social media. You know, mm -hmm. um, and we make the assumption that everybody's, everybody's going to see with one of these. <laughs> everybody's got That's right. this. You know what? Because I got one, and I can. You know, I do all the social media. But the thing is, is not everybody does. You know, not everybody does. And I think that a lot of people don't get the information. You know, and how do we, how do we fix that? Um, oh. I mean, again, it's it's tough. I think just going and meeting people where they are, you know, instead of saying we're going to have a job fair at, um, I don't know, the Coleman Center, you know, something like that. Um, keep in mind, transportation, you know, um, if you go, you're 
bringing a resume with you. A lot of people don't know how to write resumes anymore. I mean, I'm not lying. It's, it's kind of crazy. We, that's one of the classes we teach is how to write a resume. And, you know, it's funny because I told one of the students, she goes, well, I don't know. She said, I like to talk. I said, so you have great communication skills. She was like, what? I was like, yeah. <laughs> those are great communication skills. You know, you, 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 know how to, you know how to communicate with people. And, you know, and people, they kind of laugh about that, you know, just like we, we did. But, you know, honestly, you know, giving, giving the people the skills that they need to go out and keep the job. And not only, not only do we teach how to get a job, but we also talk about how to keep that job once you get that job. Because you're all gun ho to go in and, and get in and everything's going to be wonderful, and it's not really what you expected, so how do you keep that job? You know, and I think that, unfortunately, um, we, we have a lot of people out there that, you know, that, are str that struggle with that, you know, and, um, and don't always get the information. You know, they don't have television. They don't have, you know, a phone that's going to give them information. Um, and I think that that's, that's one of the challenges that we do have in our community. And... I'm not sure how to bridge that. I'm really not. I, I'll be the first. You know, I'm the first one to tell you. If I don't know something, I'll be like, I don't know. You know, so, I, so I'm not sure. You know, I get as much information as I can. My, my coworker and I, anytime we see, it, it's so funny. It's like a network. If we see a sign somewhere that says, you know, hiring, blah, 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 she'll, you know, she'll text me. And then, you know, we like immediately start putting information together and we're handing out flyers to our clients, you know, so that's kind of our own personal thing is, you know, do you know somebody who would be interested in doing this? Here you go. You know, you know, anybody that's interested in doing this and just kind of, you know, personally putting that information out there. But, you know, I'm not sure how we attack that. I'm not sure. There's been conversation over the last couple of years, particularly with, with Common Council, mm -hmm. when Roseview Transit has come up, the, the conversation is asking, are we providing the service mm -hmm. that people need? Do we need more runs? Do we need, is, are there things that city government should be considering mm -hmm. to help its citizens better themselves for where they are right now? Not where they were 20 mm -hmm. or 30 years ago, but for where they are right now. Um, I think when it comes to, it, honestly, when it comes to Roseview Transit, um, I, I think that uh, city government is, is I'm going to get myself in trouble. I think city, city government might be dropping the ball a little bit because Roseview Transit is a wonderful resource. Sure. And, um, you know, people can, can take the bus and they can ride. But, you know, hours have now been cut down. I think weekends, nights, things like that. All of these things have been kind of cut. And, and so... Let's say you work on the McDonald's on Chester Boulevard and your shift is from 2 in the afternoon until 11.30 at night. It, you don't have any way to get home from work, you know. Um, these are things that are challenging. And um, learning how to, to read a bus map, you know, know where your stops are at, know which route's going here, which route's going there. I think that we could do a little better um, in our community with that. Okay. I'm going to let you go, but I need to what? ask, what <laughs> haven't I asked you to talk about that you think needs to be mentioned? And I will say, I haven't brought up housing just Ooh. because I, I didn't want to see the smoke fly. You just need smoke, but yeah. But there's, 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 there's a housing issue. Uh, I think yeah. in this community, yeah. um, there are some landlords, some that yes. may be having some issues. How does that look for residents? How does that begin to get tackled? How do we have, because we're probably only down to our last three or four minutes, how do we have that conversation in this community? And again, because I know you walk in and out of places that you know children should not be living in. You just asked me a question that's going to take like, you know, an hour to answer. However, um, we are actually teaching um, a class right now called um, Tenants Rights and Responsibilities. Um, I think that there are so many things, there are state laws that tenants have no idea 
Um, there are things that these landlords can't do that they are doing. Um, are, uh, you know, unfortunately they're in situations where um, they're afraid if they, re if they report they'll be evicted, um, which is exactly what happens. So, um, <laughs> you know that's a tough one for me, Eric. Oh my gosh, I could go on and on and on. But, um, you know, I think that, that when you tell someone, you know, I'll tell you what, here's the deal, you give me $50, I'll let you move in today, you know, um, because they're in a pinch and they need to move in somewhere. And by the way, rent's five fifty a month, and if you're not there on the first, you're out on the second day that you don't pay. I mean, these are things that are just... Uh, Is that a bigger problem than most of us know? Yes. It's a huge problem in our city. Huge. Yeah. It, it is. It is. And people, you know what? People don't really want to hear about it. Um, and unfortunately, and I'm going to say this, and this is going to make a lot of people mad, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's money. Don't, you know, it, people don't want you getting in their pockets, you know. And if it's a Band-Aid fix, they'll do it, and they'll continue to move on with business as usual. But I'll tell you, they are doing such a disservice to these families and these children that are in this community, to our community, you know. There, it, it's really, it, yeah, it's bad. We can do a whole another hour if you want to call me in one day and we can talk about that. So, okay. yeah, I'll, we I'll, could. I'll we do could. that. I'll even let you bring pictures. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, you know, it's, it's disheartening. It really is. Um, there are places that I go to that are just, it's disheartening sometimes, you know, and, and the people are doing the best they can to uh, make a good home mm -hmm. in a place that is uninhabitable. And it's just, it's very sad, it's very sad. And it is my passion. And since I've been on city council, this is, I'm going into 11 years now, um, we've talked about this before you know this is this is a problem that has not gone away it's it's hasn't gotten any better um it, in some cases it's gotten worse and you know there are a lot of people who talk about it and want to fix it but it doesn't it's it's not there it's just not there and we need to do a better job of that we truly need to do a better job of that anytime anybody wants to give me a call ask if they can do a day ride with me please feel free I will, <laughs> I will take you and we can, we can talk about this, you know, and, and, you know. And this show is not meant to be a downer, but mm -hmm. as we move this community forward, yes. we want to make sure that we're moving this community forward with everyone or as exactly. many as we possibly can. Exactly. And I think that that's exactly what um, I want to say. Our, the community is not you and I. The community is not the business owners. The community is just not, I mean, it's everyone. And we need to look at everyone in this community and how we relate, how we, um, you know, speak to, how we treat uh, to, to everyone, not just certain individuals. So, yeah. Kelly, I've been it. wanting to have this conversation with you for a while. I appreciate you taking some time today. No worries. Thank you. Thank you for watching this week's episode of In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. We'll be with you again next Thursday evening. Have a good night.